not aware of what we're going to be talking about, there's a class action case filed in Cuyahoga County by Mark, and it's against uh, Lurgan, Sampson, and Rothfuss down in Cincinnati. And uh, in the ongoing side of the foreclosure crisis, uh, there may be some problems with their authority to sit back and file foreclosure suits. And I think it's going to be a very interesting, interesting case. And uh, as it progresses, I think it's going to pick up a lot more national traction as well. So, if you would, our guest speaker today is Mark I also wanted to recognize uh, on the, uh, my colleagues in my office and in the Lerner Sampson case, Jim Douglas and Grace Doverdruck are here. As Paul, who I went to high school with, knows I turned 49 over this past weekend. Uh, and those of you who are as old as I am can remember when foreclosures were simple and straightforward actions. That's when the loans were originated by local banks, and the most sophisticated transaction that took place after a loan closed was, was the sale of servicing rights. Over the past decade, all that has changed as loans generated by thousands of mortgage brokers, mortgage lenders, and banking institutions like the wonderful folks at Countrywide were sold or transferred multiple times on their way to becoming part of new, complex, derivative mortgage-backed securities marketed by all of the biggest investment banks on Wall Street. The securitization of the loans involved many undisclosed parties, each of whom were compensated, and many of whom helped those mortgage brokers violate the Truth in Lending Act, the real estate, see this does not work, uh, the real estate uh, uh, settlement procedures act and the pooling and servicing agreements for those bonds that where those mortgages ultimately ended up uh, on file with the Securities and Exchange Commission. The volume and complexity of these transactions in conjunction with the collapse of the housing market and the collapse of the economy in general uh, over the past several years has complicated the mortgage foreclosure process beyond anybody's imagination. Because the lender, the assignee, the servicing company, and the trustee may all at the same time claim to own the same promissory note. And the landscape for representing homeowners facing foreclosure in Ohio seems to change almost on a daily basis. Changes in government programs to help homeowners in default make advising clients about options challenging. Evolving case law makes predicting the outcome of foreclosure suits and the likelihood of success on potential counterclaims difficult. Most significantly, the archaic process of the court system, lenders, and lawyers who represent lenders, they just simply weren't designed to deal with the securitization practices of the lending industry over the past decade, or with the sheer volume of homeowners in default in Ohio, or allegedly in default, I should say, in Ohio and across the country. Determining how much a homeowner owes and to whom he or she owes it can be much more complicated than one can ever imagine. Uh, last, a couple weeks ago in the New York Times, they detailed the struggle of Zella Mae Green, a Georgia homeowner, and her lawyer to simply determine who actually held her mortgage note and therefore had the right to collect or foreclose. How much she owed, she claimed to be four payments behind. Wells Fargo, the alleged servicer of her loan, uh, claimed, uh, uh, claimed many different numbers, but ultimately claimed that she was as many as 113 payments behind. It's critical for those of us who have taken on defending foreclosures or looking to offer title insurance to properties that were subject to foreclosure in the past to challenge even the simplest claim made by a lender in such action. In the Green case, the Wells Fargo representatives signed affidavits swearing to three different stories. First, they claimed the note was lost. Next, by sworn affidavit, they claimed the note existed but had never been transferred to the bank. Finally, they alleged they had the note in their possession, but settled the case before they actually had to prove it. Had the lawyer representing the homeowner in the case not insisting on, insisted on taking the deposition of the affidavit signers, the homeowner might have been forced to pay tens of thousands of dollars more than she actually owed, or potentially paid it to the wrong person, someone who didn't even hold the note, risking the possibility that the true note holder could emerge later seeking payment from the client. We've seen similar scenarios over and over again in Ohio. Some foreclosure plaintiff's law firms, I won't name names, well I will, uh, <laughs> actually have their own employees appointed as officers of their clients. Depositions we've taken prove that those employees sign assignments of notes 
and mortgages with no actual knowledge of whether or not the entity assigning the note or the mortgage has the actual authority to do so, or whether or not the note is actually in their possession. Our office alone has represented homeowners in dozens of cases that were voluntarily dismissed by the lender's counsel when they were forced to prove that their client actually held the note that they were trying to collect. And finally, with the urging of people like Paul Bellamy and the activists in the foreclosure world, the Cuyahoga County Court of, Court of Common Police has finally put in place a rule that really is going to prevent that, I believe, from happening in the future. But what is happening is instead of having, instead of being able to prove these these cases that they, that these law firms, and particularly Lerner Sampson, who we've sued, who just has such a huge market share of the of the mortgage foreclosures in the state of Ohio, uh, what what they what they what they've decided to do instead is just to dismiss and quit, and take their their their, their ball and go home, rather than to try to actually prove the cases that they were presenting. Some of these practices are the subject of a recent lawsuit we filed against Lerner Sampson currently pending in the Northern District of Ohio before Judge Gwynn. In that case, we allege that filing a lawsuit on behalf of a party who a lawyer knows or should know lacks standing is a violation of both the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and the Ohio Consumer Sales Practices Act. And in fact, Judge Gwynn has agreed with us and said that if we can prove what we've alleged uh, by turning down their motion to dismiss, if we can prove what we allege that the Ohio Consumer Sales Practices Act does indeed apply. Uh, to this type of conduct. And much of the problem, as I alluded to earlier, goes back to the securitization frenzy of the last decade. Many of the foreclosures filed in, uh, recently in Ohio were those that were caused in the creation of those mortgage-backed securities. Many of these mortgages were originated by lenders who have since declared bankruptcy or shut down. The defunct legal status of the lenders raises a very real question about who actually owns and or holds the promissory notes, or has the ability to assign them, transfer them, or endorse them. Many mortgages were bundled into securitized trusts on Wall Street. However, in order for these mortgages to be validly conveyed to the trusts, the trusts had to have actual possession of the original mortgages and promissory note. And it must be endorsed under Ohio law in conformity with Ohio Revised Code 1303.24. Lawyers in the room know that's the, the, the Uniform Commercial Code. It's now becoming clear more than clear that many lenders cut corners and did not uh, validly transfer the mortgages into trust. We now, when a, when a case comes in with a securitized uh, uh, mortgage, routinely go to the SEC website, pull the trust instruments, and find out the closing date. Because oftentimes you'll see the assignment that's alleged took place, or the, or the endorsement, took place long after New York law says that that securitized trust had to close. It doesn't belong to the trust. Yet law firms and lawyers are filing today lawsuits on behalf of those entities claiming ownership of notes that they don't can't possibly under the, by operation of law hold. The legal problem we're seeing now is that whenever a homeowner falls behind in payments, the trust does not hold the original note uh, in order to foreclose. That's where robo signers come into play. There are certain document uh, processing companies, and law firms have their own uh, robo signing departments. Where, certain doc where, where for a fee, they'll create assignments of mortgages and other documents to make it look like that trust, that bank, or that servicing company has the legal right to foreclose when no legal right exists under law. The issue of whether or not plaintiffs in foreclosure actions have standing is not an abstract legal theory at all. Courts throughout Ohio, and particularly in the 8th Appellate District here in Cleveland, have dismissed cases for lack of standing when the lender could not prove the ownership of the note at the time of filing of the foreclosure complaint. At the time of filing of the foreclosure complaint. The law says that an owner does, that a foreclosing plaintiff does not have standing. The court lacks jurisdiction to even hear the proceeding on a foreclosure on a note when they don't hold the note at the time they file the complaint. And this becomes very important. It's, it's not a great stretch and I've actually filed a case, Davitt versus Mickley, uh, that's currently pending in, in, in Cuyahoga County Common Police Court, to argue that that void ab initio judgment rendered from a decision w for which the court lacked jurisdiction voids the entire transaction. And in the Davitt case, we're seeking a quiet title action on his old house. Now, Dick Davitt is a character in and of himself. He's the, he had the longest foreclosure case in Cuyahoga County. It lasted over 10 years. He had a profile of, uh, in the Wall Street Journal. But we're seeking to return him to his home. 
because the because there is no factual dispute that Ted, that they did not transfer the note uh, the ownership of his note to the party that received the foreclosure against him until 14 days after at the earliest after that complaint was filed and so the question we've raised and put squarely in a very clean way in front of the Cuyahoga County Common Police Court is whether or not that void judgment would allow that title to also be void. All kinds of interesting questions and, and unanswered questions coming. Other issues worth looking at and then we can go on forever and I'm happy to answer questions about uh, the little bit that I know although there's a lot of expertise, there's bankruptcy expertise in this room and expertise in the mortgage process far beyond, beyond mine is whether plaintiff's lenders have complied with federal regulations regarding workouts and loan modifications. For example, FHA requires a face-to-face -face meeting with homeowners in default prior to filing a foreclosure as a condition precedent to filing that foreclosure insured by FHA. What does that mean? Not only does the, does the plaintiff in a foreclosure case need to have, uh, have had that meeting, but if they have had the meeting, they, they, the lawyer needs to allege in the complaint that that meeting has taken place or potentially that foreclosure is, is, is voidable. Whether the lenders have violated the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and is now the evolving case law around the Consumer Sales Practices Act. And whether filing a claim uh, without standing constitutes a toy, tort of wrongful foreclosure and there's a whole, uh, a whole slew of common law coming. There's even peril to homeowners who try to work with lenders to modify loan arrangements through a variety of programs that include the federal HAMP program and modification, individualized modification programs overseen by lenders. Recently we filed Halabsa versus the uh, uh, Bank of America Home Servicing Loan Company uh, in Cuyahoga County seeking class action certification relating to a growing problem of lenders offering trial modifications with the promise that that modification would become permanent if the homeowner makes the trial payments and there's no material change in the circumstances of the borrower. This isn't language I made up, it's right in the contract that Bank of America offered to our, client, the, our clients the halabsis. Make the three payments, nothing changes in your circumstances, we shall modify your loan. They signed it, we signed it. And it's a form that was, uh, that was actually created by Fannie Mae and prescribed to the lenders to use in these, HAMP, in these original set of HAMP modifications that went on. While this was in progress, of course, the Bank of America filed for foreclosure against the halabsis. When we filed a motion to enforce their settlement agreement, which was in writing as is required under the statute of frauds, the bank voluntarily dismissed, leaving the halapses with no idea how much they owed, or frankly at this point, who they owed it to. Decisions regarding modification are also arbitrary and depend on the competence of the service or representative involved in the negotiation. Subtle changes in how a homeowner's financial picture is presented to the lender can make or break such processes. Having competent representation in this process is just as important as it is in litigating these cases. But it's amazing to me that despite all the publicity about the abuses of lenders and the law firms in foreclosure cases, the vast majority of foreclosures still proceed with the defendant homeowner unrepresented. And that's where everybody in this room needs to worry twice as hard. Legitimate issues of standing and business practices go unchallenged every day in Ohio. We fear that thousands of Ohio homeowners may have abandoned or lost their homes to plaintiffs who can't prove their case.